already live. So if you want just to try, Dr. Uh, your uh, Satya, if you want to share your yeah. screen, just to be sure that everything is okay. One second, uh, share screen, yeah. Yeah, is it uh, visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 everything. So you can stop share now, just for a few yeah. minutes. After we start, yeah, we yeah. will uh, we'll give you the... Mm. Sure. Dr. Ahmad, he will join us a little bit late because this is a working day for him. We changed the date from Friday. I think Armando, maybe you want to see him, he will, he will join us, but uh, maybe after your talk, when you are talking, maybe at that time he will join us. So for uh, discussions. Sure. We will take two minutes more so we can keep our colleagues to join. Then we'll start. Sure.
<clears throat> so we can start now. Uh, Assalamu alaikum uh, and good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, following us now from wherever he is. Uh, I would like to thank all the, uh, the, our uh, guest speaker today. We are having a very eminent speaker today. Uh, we are, as usual, we are having two uh, parts of the session. The first part, it will be a different subject. Then we'll go to the usual episode that we are conducting for either for uveitis or medical retina or uh, refractive. And today is the fourth episode of uveitis. It will be about intermediate uveitis. Uh, first of all, also, I would like uh, to thank all the participants. Also, my uh, thanks also to sponsoring company, Alargan, Abdi, for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, also for all participants, uh, they are all the time I am receiving message about the certificate of attendance. Usually we are keeping the link in the chat. Please, before you move or before you close, please uh, be sure that you have downloaded your certificate. Today, again, we will ask the management to uh, put all the links of the previous uh, episode so everyone he is he missed to get his certificate last time he can get it this time uh, and and without any further delay i would like first to introduce our speakers please can you share a screen for me management hello yes uh, so today with us, Dr. Ahmed in the panelist and co-moderator, Dr. Ahmed Salam. He is an MD, PhD, FRCO of ophthalmology, professor of ophthalmology. He's a veterinary surgeon and UVITIS specialist, staff Jones Eye Institute, University of Arkansas for medical science in USA. He will join us in the second uh, sessions or second part of the meeting. Uh, our speakers, uh, the first speaker, will be Dr. Uh, Safia, and he's a specialist ophthalmologist and veterinary retinal surgeon, Borjil Medical City, Abu Dhabi, UAE. And also I am today, I'm proud and uh, pleasure, having the pleasure and honor to have my dear friends, Dr. Armando Oliver, he's an associate professor chair, Department of Ophthalmology, co-director of Ophthalmology Research University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine, University, of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. Uh, this is maybe the third time we are meeting uh, in this, uh, uh, we are having, we are learning a lot from him and we are happy that he is joining us today. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Hassan, he is uh, having some, because we changed the date of the meeting, he couldn't make to be with us. But I think Dr. Armando, he will do all the best, inshallah, to cover all the session about intermediate events. And according to the agenda, the first part of this meeting, it will start with Dr. Satya, and he is going to talk about computer vision syndrome management. So Dr. Satya, the mic with you, please. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for your kind words. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, a very good evening, uh, my dear friends. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, the team uh, MIOM uh, as well as uh, the uh, team from Abwe for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this esteemed um, uh, group. So uh, today um, we would be discussing on a very important topic that is the computer vision syndrome and its management. And you would be wondering why this particular topic uh, Post-COVID, where in which uh, most of our work, especially the techies as well as in the other sector, they have been confined to the computers for prolonged hours, as well as the school-going children, uh, where in which they were de devoting a huge amount of time uh, doing their classes online. We see the problems pertaining to computer vision syndrome in a much more magnified manner. So... Um, can you share screen, please? Can you share screen? It's not uh, visible, sir. No, no, you are still, we are not seeing the screen. One second. So, 
is it visible now yeah yes yeah so um yeah so to begin with um, uh, this particular presentation um uh, if you could see this slide you can see that this is a very very common site especially in our day to day um, uh, household so there are many uh, aspects of it which has gone wrong in this particular way of working you can see that you know the laptop is is on the floor with a lot of eatables as well as uh, this lady is uh, multitasking so certainly uh, there are a lot of flaws and though it's a very common sight there are a lot of flaws in this particular way of functioning and we will be going through what are the flaws and how we could overcome this so to begin with computers have become an irreplaceable necessity in our lives both at work and at home and there is no escape to this and computer vision syndrome is a complex of eye and vision problems related to the activities that stress the near vision and which are experienced in relation to working or during the use of computers when i mean computers it can mean other electronic gadgets whether it is an ipad or whether it's a tablet or even a mobile smartphone and these include eye strains headaches blurry near vision slowness in changing focus light sensitivity and eye irritation and i'm sure as practicing ophthalmologists we see these symptoms in a very uh, common way and the improper ergonomic practice can lead to pain in the neck shoulder and back as well as pain in the wrist in the form of carpal tunnel syndrome so this becomes an amalgamation of many such problems which uh, most of the patients present as with so as we can see here um the current digital world uh, there is a rapid shift from paper to computers mobiles e readers and other visual display terminals and what we were reading books and novels in the form of printed matter now has been shifted with e readers as well as maybe uh, in the form of uh, kindle so what actually is the problem is the computer screens do not have a good contrast and the characters are in the form of pixels which are brightest at the center and they start diminishing in intensity at the edges in comparison with the good contrast which is seen in printed papers and our eyes as such is not too very familiar with such kind of a pixels and so instead our eye starts to drift towards the point of resting point of accommodation as you can see here the resting point of accommodation is much more further away than the usual practice of the using the screen so when we start using the computers which is much more nearer than the 30 inches there is a huge uh, strain on the ciliary muscles which starts working about two and a half times harder to focus on the monitor than usual uh, resting point of accommodation and to add to this you, there is also a huge amount of glare and reflections the presence of glare and reflections on the screen also makes the viewing of the computers difficult and along with bright lights of the windows as well as the fluorescent lights which we use at our workplace this is going to turn out to be a annoying effect the light from these sources needs to be controlled with proper blinds screen filters or a change in the room arrangement can definitely be a relief for this uh, annoying effect of glare and reflections different age groups they require different intensity of light for instance a person who is more than 50 years of age requires twice the amount of light which is required by a normal young adult for the same task and to add to this the blue light has a wavelength of about 380 to 500 microns making it one of the shortest and high energy wavelengths and this blue light also has another problem that it causes flickering effect and glare which is certainly one of the most important aspects of the computer usage artificial sources of blue light includes the digital screens of tv computers laptops smartphones and tablets as well as other electronic devices and fluorescent and led lighting so the commercially available blue light filter spectacles decreases the blue light by close to about 10 to 23% and this can be useful while using the uh, digital uh, devices 
Now, when we start looking into the screen time of adults, it is seen that in the uh, UK, close to about four hours to 45 minutes per day is the average screen time, which is also similar to what it is in the US. And approximately uh, two thirds of the adults in the age group of about 30 to 50 years spend five or more hours in, with these kind of digital devices. And as you can see at the work, this is how the situation is. Most of the times we start using the computers and the moment we come home, for the sake of entertainment, we start using a television, which is again a digital device with a lot of screen time, or even while casually sitting, it is most of the time we are hooked on to or the mobiles and we uh, tend to use them in a much more uh, prolonged manner. So when we start looking into the children, today's children are definitely been so um, rampantly hooked on to the digital devices. And when we look at the WHO recommendation, uh, a child which is one to two years has the at the most uh, one hour of screen time is what is being recommended, but most of the uh, current uh, toddlers as well as children less than four years, they spend more than about two or three hours on an average. So certainly there is something to be or really be worried about. The screen time in children also causes other effects in the form of uh, the develop, they don't develop optimally and there is uh, impairment in the gross motor skills, which are seen in toddlers. And it also disrupts the interpersonal and communication skills. In older children, the sedentary behavior also causes other problems like physical fitness, obesity, and high cardiometabolic risks. It also impacts the mental health by causing disturbed sleep, low self-esteem, they display social phobias, and also are more stressed with anxiety. The ocular signs can be in the form of increased sensitivity to light, accommodation anomalies, headaches, and eye aches which are seen in the pediatric age group. So many decades earlier, when a child used to be alone, he used to play with the, he or she used to play with toys, or at the most they used to indulge with, uh, indulge in physical sport where they meet up with their friends. But unfortunately these days, most of the children are hooked on to computer games, or even when they are with their friends, they play games which are with the digital devices. So the pathophysiology of the digital eye strain or the computer vision syndrome can be classified into three parts. That is the ocular surface mechanism wherein which dry eye is the most predominant problem. And this is because of the reduced reduction in the blink rate and increased corneal exposure. There can be other problems like because of accommodative mechanism, which leads to blurred near or distance vision, or it can be because of the extracellular mechanism in the form of neck stiffness, pain, headaches, backache, and shoulder pain. So the ocular surface related symptoms are mostly in the form of dryness, burning sensation, grittiness, or heaviness after extended period of time at the terminal. And the dry eye can be due to the decrease in the blink rate and because of the desiccation of the tears from the cornea. The environmental factors which are generally seen at the workplace can also contribute in the form of dry air, the ventilation fans, the static built-ups, as well as the airborne paper dust, laser and photocopy toners, and building contaminants, which can again contribute to the uh, dry eye symptoms. The reduced blink rate and increased exposure is because of the increase in the wider palpable fissure while working on computers and because of the effect of evaporation. So when we see, when we talk about the dry eyes, it is usually seen in females more than males, and with age, there is a worsening of the dry eye symptoms. The systemic disease, both in the form of Jogren's and Jogren's related autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid related disorders, rosacea and connective tissue disorders can also contribute to dry eyes. Systemic medications, which usually the patients are on like diuretics, antihistamines, psychotropic drugs and antihypertensive can also contribute to dry eyes and contact lens usage makes us uh, situation worse. Mebomin gland diseases as well as cosmetics can also contribute to the symptoms of dry eyes. Now coming to the second astenopic symptoms, it is the prolonged computer usage which causes diminished power of accommodation with removal of the near point of convergence and usually the four years turn out to, uh, turn, to uh, turn out to be tropias. 
the headaches can be related to the refractive errors. Myopia and astigmatism are the commonest, or it could be because of the improper workplace conditions, which can be in the form of glare, poor lighting, or improper workstation setups. These can also contribute to the headaches and eye strain. And again, eye strain in turn can be because of the focusing spasm, anisometropia, astigmatism, as well as myopia or because of the excessive light. Now the light sensitivity is usually because of the difference in the light uh, brightness between the computer as well as the surrounding, uh, uh, surrounding uh, light of the room. The blurred vision can be because of small refractive error and the blurred images can also arise because of the dirt in the screen, poor viewing angle, or it can be because of the reflected glare. Also, one of the most important aspects which needs to be considered is the neck and the back pain, which can definitely cause other kind of uh, issues. Now, the most uh, important uh, remedial measures in order to overcome the computer vision syndrome is to address, adjust the brightness and the contrast. Most of the people working on computers, they feel comfortable when they work on a contrast setup of about 60 to 70. And once you have set the contrast between 60 to 70, you will have to adjust the brightness and the brightness should be in such a way that the computer as well as the surrounding room light are uh, in sync. Uh, when the room light is too bright or when the computer or screen light is too bright, it causes annoyance and it can also lead to the symptoms of computer vision syndrome. Another important thing which you need to understand is the quality of air as well as humidity. When we start working on the computers, most of the times we keep blowers and fans in front of our, in front of our face, which is definitely not an advisable thing. And also the lighting and the windows, ideally speaking, should be towards the side, not in front, not behind the screen. So these are a few small tips, like in the form of uh, to minimize the glare, you can use uh, the shields or the anti-reflective uh, screens which are available commercially. This can be used on top of the computers and when you are using some kind of a, uh, reference material, it has to be kept on a stand so that you don't keep moving your head up and down. Ideally speaking, when you are working on a desktop, this is how the posture has to be. Um, the, the computer screen should be at an angle uh, which is beneath your eyes. This should be the area of focus and your seating should be such that you are sitting upright and your thigh should be parallel to the ground and there should be sufficient amount of uh, support to your foot as well as to the elbow. Now the treatment of the computer vision syndrome is multidirectional and it depends upon the kind of uh, complaints which they present with. When treating a patient, it is important to consider the ocular therapy as well as uh, how they actually work, that is the ergonomic approach. The most important thing is when using computers, you have to remember to blink. Uh, and most of the times we keep staring at the computers and forget to blink. And this can also contribute in a big way for the dry eye symptoms. The computer position, as I just told you, should be in such a way that the head and neck are upright to the torso and the face of your screen should be directly in front of the computer and you should avoid viewing with the head turn or back twisted position. The elbow should be com comfortably placed and close to the body and use a chair that supports both the lower back and the position of the top of the computer screen should be slightly below the eye level and also adjust the position of your display to prevent reflection from overhead light or from outdoor lighting. When working with printed documents, use a document holder that positions them at the same height and distance as your screen. And also adjust the height of the chair so that the upper arm are perpendicular to the floor and forearm and wrist are at 90 degrees. So, and another important thing which you need to remember is to take periodic breaks. So and we know the fact that the 20-20-20 rule is very important. So when you're working on computer, try to take your eyes off the computer every 20 minutes and try to look into an object which is 20 feet away and blink for at least 20 seconds. Also frequent breaks can be accompanied with stretch up exercises and take a walk around and you can do 
some amount of stretcher which is going to relieve the spasm of working hours together. The artificial tears is one of the simplest modes of therapy as the uh, eye which has been lubricated can give you good amount of relief. Although higher viscosity drops uh, do not actually vary with the blink rates, but it can definitely give you a good amount of relief for your computer vision syndrome uh, symptoms. You can uh, pick up the artificial tears over the counter or, uh, it is be or it is always better to use the preservative P lubricant eye drops, which don't have any significant effect on the corneal toxicity. And when you are using the uh, eyewear, especially for um, people who are more than 40 years, it would be a good idea to use progressive glasses because this is going to be the appropriate distance by which you can use the desktop. Also, an anti-reflective coating in the glasses would be a good choice. So the treatment is predominantly uh, divided into the topical lubricants. Uh, if the situation is worse, you can go in for cyclosporone of thalmic emulsions. And in real bad cases, you can probably try for punctal occlusions. And to summarize, uh, the patients suffering from computer vision syndromes can present to the eye care specialist in a variety of ways. A careful history is very vital, especially the way the computer usage is and in the context with which they are using the computers. And also the environment and the lighting factors has to be considered uh, while uh, at work. So these are my references. So if there are any questions, I'm ready to take it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sati, for this uh, excellent presentation. And you take us thank on a you. journey in all about one of the most important topic that we are suffering now. Every one of us is suffering of that. I think we are now, we are giving the lecture through the computer itself. And you are looking straight to the... <laughs> so, very true, sir. Yeah, so every, the computer now and laptops, mobiles, uh, in all hands. Even though they are Correct. not working through using the computer, they are using the Apple uh, iPhones or whatever. So it's really a, a big problem, especially in now even the children, as you mentioned. Um, there is all the times question coming from the, I mean, the mothers of the children usually. Is it affecting the vision? So they are saying, and they are trying to all the times tell the boy, don't use the computer. He should not use it too much now like this and prevent him from computer. Do you advise to prevent or do you advise just to adjust or what is your advice? Yeah, absolutely, sir. Most of the times, see, I, I don't think we have a choice these days, especially when the older children have most of the classes online, especially the tuitions and other classes which are going to be online. And what has uh, been specific, uh, what has been recommended by most of the societies is, uh, is to cut down on the screen time. The whole issue is it is not on the classes that they are uh, they are having the extended amount of time using the computers. It is the gaming as well as the other social activities by which they spend a huge amount of time. I think the parents have to be counseled in such a way that to curtail the screen time for not more than an hour beyond the school time is uh, what has been recommended. And more so, we'll have to really uh, educate the parents uh, in the right usage of computers when they're using a desktop or um, maybe even a, a laptop. It is the correct usage of the uh, gadgets, which is more important. Because most of the time you can see that the children, whether it is an iPad or whatever it is, at every random place, they keep using it. And that is not something which is recommended. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, one more question only. Um, do you think there is a benefit from using uh, a glasses? A glasses really, this is a screen that prevent it from, so they are a special, they are saying a special glasses for using the screens? Yeah, yeah, probably it is more of a marketing gimmick. But having said that, most of the glasses, you can see that they are having anti-reflective coating and most of the uh, CFT screens uh, or the computers and other screens, now they are um, having anti-reflective coating. But having said that, when we are using those um, blue filtering glasses, uh, it is going to give you another added protection of about 10 to 25% uh, and nothing more than that. 
uh, but certainly it is not a good idea to get hooked on to glasses on a, a regular way if it is going to be uh, uh, anti glare with a blue light protective glasses i think it makes sense for about 10 to 25 percent for whatever worth it is. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tathia, for this excellent presentation and discussions. You can stay with us, so we can now move to sure. our fourth episode of UVITIS, and I would like to welcome Dr. Ahmed Salam. He joined us now. Dr. Ahmed, most welcome. Thank you. I hope. Thank you so, so much. So now is the time for Dr. Armando, Salam. Dr. Armando, is the mic with you, please, and we want to enjoy your lectures and discussions with the presence of Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alambri, for your uh, kind invitation. I really enjoy uh, sharing with my friends from the Middle East uh, uh, these talks. Very nice of you, and thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit about intermediate uveitis, a fascinating subject. It was uh, intermediate uveitis, uh, has had many names along its history. In 1908, it was first called cyclitis. Dr. Skeppens called it peripheral uveitis in 1950. Then in 1960, Welsh was the first person to call it pars planitis. Dr. Gass called it vitritis in 1961. And it was not until 1987 that the International Uveitis Study Group decided to call it intermediate uveitis, which is the present name. The Sun criteria made a, in 2005 established uh, what should be our research nomenclature for uveitis. And intermediate uveitis is the term that should be used for inflammation pertaining to the vitreous. The term pars planitis should only be used when that intermediate uveitis occurs with both snowballs and snow banking. This is a depiction of what snowballs are. The snowballs are the these uh, vitreous deposits and snow bankings are the deposits that occur in pars plana. The differential diagnosis, most commonly this condition is idiopathic. However, up to 20% of cases may be associated with multiple sclerosis in some series. Other common associations include sarcoidosis, syphilis, and Lyme disease. And Bartonella should also be considered in people who have cats, specifically, if, especially if there's uh, evidence of either a cotton wool spot or a small amount of retinitis, and of course, uh, neuroretinitis. Least common associations include lymphoma, either primary or secondary, undiagnosed toxocaracanis, perhaps a, a granuloma that was missed very in the periphery, HTLB1 infection, Bechet's disease, and also within the differential inactive cells from either resolved iridocyclitis or retinitis pigmentosa, or a patient that has something like Burchett or Acer that has not yet called itself out. Remember, patients with Burchett may present with a vasculitis, and it's only on ICG that we see the Burchett lesions in some rare cases. And Acer may have a time while the lesion of, of the auto retinopathy is still a cold, and it will call itself out later. So those sorts of things are also in the differential of intermediate uveitis. Epidemiology it represents about 10% of all uveitis patients. It can occur either from childhood to the elderly population. There's no true gender predilection, and 80% of the time it can be bilateral, and it is often asymmetric, it could be very, very asymmetric sometimes. The presentation, most commonly, if patients will present with indolent symptoms such as floaters, decreased vision, and photophobia. The eye may be white, it might have a few KP or anterior chamber cells, no synechia, CME in vitro cells. However, in a small, uh, in frequent cases, we can have patients that present with acute symptoms, especially on the first attack, such as pain, redness, and photophobia. However, that's less common. So remembering the clinical findings, the sine qua non, what every patient must have is vitreous cells. They may or may not have snowballs and snow banking. However, if they have all three of them, we call it pars planitis. And then we have to consider multiple sclerosis and really CNS lymphoma as part of the diagnosis. The potential complications of intermediate uveitis include CME, cataracts, glaucoma, optic disc edema, optic neuritis, retinal detachment, venous sheathing, vasculitis, retinal neovascularization, and vasoproliferative tumor of the retina periphery. However, due to the time constraints today, we'll talk 
specifically about CME, which is perhaps the most common complication. It can occur in up to 50% of patients. The most common cause of visual loss in, in patients with immediate uveitis. And the more severe the inflammation, the more likely we're going to have CME. As for the treatment of CME, it is important to point out the point trial. In this trial, it was a, a randomized clinical trial in which patients were randomized one to one to one to either posterior subtenous triamcinolone, intravitreal triamcinolone acetonide, or an intravitreal dexamethasone implant, Osirtex. The primary outcome we can see is, is the proportion of central thickness remaining at eight weeks over the central thickness at baseline. The secondary outcomes included the per percentage of patients that had over a 20% improvement and resolution of macular edema and improvement of best corrective visual acuity, as well as the intracular pressure at 24 weeks. The results from the point trial revealed that all treatment groups showed improved central uh, subfield thickness. It showed that intravitreal triamcinolone and intravitreal dexamethasones had greater reductions in central subfield thickness than in patients that had periocular triamcinolone. It also showed that the intravitreal dexamethasone implant also this was not inferior to intravitreal triamcinolone, showed that both intravitreal triamcinolone and osteotic treatments were also superior to posterior subtenous triamcinolone in, in improving and resolving uveitic macular edema. Both intravitreal triamcinolone and osteotic groups had improvements of best corrective visual acuity that was five letters greater than the posterior subtenous triamcinolone group. In terms of intraocular pressure, the risk of having an intraocular pressure greater than 24 millimeters of mercury was higher in the intravitreal treatment groups compared with the periocular groups. So to conclude, intravitreal triamcinolone and intravitreal dexamethasone implant were superior to periocular triamcinolone for the treatment of uveitic macular edema with only modest increases in the risk of intraocular pressure. As far as treatment for intermediate uveitis, there are many things to consider. First, we should consider the amount of vitritis. Is, if, is it severe enough? That's causing the decrease of visual acuity. The presence of macular edema. The presence of true ischemic vasculitis, retinal detachment, neovascularization, and other factors to consider are the laterality, the severity of the disease, the clinical course, is it responding or not to therapy, and other comorbid illnesses such as diabetes, obesity, Bechet's disease, lymphoma, etc. Treatment, as a general rule, always suppress the anterior chamber inflammation and always treat non-2020 CME, even though I should say that I oftentimes treat 2020 cystic macular edema myself. Avoid setting for partial results and always try to obtain a dry macular when treating cystic macular edema. Our treatment arsenal includes steroids, be it topical, periocular, intraocular, and oral steroids, anti-metabolic agents such as Celsep, methotrexate, and imuran, cyclosporine A, which may be added to the anti-metabolic agents, alkylating agents as last resource in site-threatening situations, and biologics such as anti-TNF-alpha, anti-HLUKIN-6, and anti-CD20, and not to forget parse plan of vitrectomy. A good friend of mine, uh, Karina Quinones, well, she was a fellow with Dr. C. Stephen Foster. She did a prospective trial of 18 eyes of 16 patients that were randomized either to parse plan of vitrectomy or systemic immunosuppressive therapy. They found that a higher percentage of patients that were treated with parse plan of vitrectomy had improvement in the, of their uveitis compared to those that were treated with systemic immunosuppression. Likewise, Dr. Kempen looked at the site cohort study, which is a multicenter co uh, cohort study of, of uveitis, and they looked at factors that led to remission in patients with intermediate uveitis. They found that, first of all, the rate of remission is low. It's about uh, 8.6 per 100 I years, and they're, they found that patients that had recently diagnosed disease that were older, female, and Hispanic were more likely to have remissions. However, in terms of treatment, they found that patients that had received parsflana vitrectomy as treatment of their intermediate uveitis had an increased probability of remission 
when compares with those patients who receive systemic immunosuppression. There, finally, a word on prognosis. The prognosis depends on the severity of inflammation as well as the promptness and adequacy of treatment. Most series show that only 20 to 40 percent of patients will have a visual acuity of 20, 40 or less. And as we all know, aggressive treatment has been shown to improve outcomes and prognosis in patients with uveitis. Now, this is a, this, if anybody has any questions. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and give you a few cases and we'll do the questions after that. Uh, this is the, the first case. This is a 25 year old Hispanic man who came to the clinic complaining of floaters for three weeks. His referral diagnosis was that of intermediate uveitis. He had been treated with topical corticosteroids, ifloprednate by uh, the referring retina specialist, and this led to the resolution of his symptoms. His past medical history was unremarkable. However, there was a family history of Takayasu's arthritis. It was a close relative, an aunt. His social history it was pertinent for social alcohol use, no tobacco, illicit drugs, or pets or recent travels. And he has some atrologies. However, the review system was otherwise unremarkable. His visual acuity was 20 20 in both eyes. His tensions were normal, as was his silic lamb exam. He had some snowballs and two plus cells present in the anterior and posterior vitreous in both eyes. He also had sheathing of the venules for 360 degrees in both eyes. And of concern was an area of ischemic retina of one disc area present in, in feronasal to the disc. This is how the, the fundus looked. There were some snowballs in the periphery. And this is the fluorescein angiogram. And the area of concern that I was talking to you about was this area of retinal ischemia, which is telling us that the patient does have ischemic vasculitis. And that's always a concern because if that ischemia goes to the optic disc, the patient will have a very poor prognosis. So this patient, uh, this is the ICG, which was clean. So it ruled out uh, choroiditis for the most part. We did a workup. It was negative for FDABS and RPR. We ruled out syphilis. The chest X-ray was non-contributory. The brain MRI also showed uh, a single focus of hyperintensity in T2 with some restricted diffusion. And although that was not specific, the radiologists thought that that could be secondary to CNS vasculitis, a small focus of CNS vasculitis. The pathitis panel was negative, such as was his quantiferin TB gold. He was HLA B27 positive. He was negative for HLA A29 and B51. He also had a rheumatology workup, which showed that he was rheumatology the rheumatoid factor negative, and he had inflammatory arthritic changes and sacroiliitis. This was a workup that I did not order. It was ordered by his retina specialist. So there are things here that I would have probably not ordered, but they were still interesting to see. Uh, thus far, we have a 25-year-old man with bilateral intermediate uveitis and ischemic retinal vasculitis with a family history of Takayasus. The MRI showed possible evidence of CNS vasculitis. It was HLA-B27 positive. And he had a bone scan positive for sacroiliitis. No evidence of Burchett or Bichette's, and it was 2020. What did I order? Well, I ordered a gallium scan, ANCA, MPO, PIR3, ANA, Lyme antibodies, and a metabolic workup, all which was within normal limits. I started the patient on prednisone 60 milligrams per day. We should not exceed 60 milligrams because that is associated with an increased risk of a vascular necrosis of bone. We saw insurance approval for Humira. However, he, he did so well at two weeks, he was quiet that we decided to just start tapering the prednisone without giving him any Humira disjunction. When we taper prednisone, it is very important to always do it in a standardized fashion. We taper by 10 milligram intervals per week from 60 until 40 milligrams. Then we go by five milligrams per week until the 20 milligram dose. Then we go by 2.5 milligrams per week until the 10 milligram dose is reached. If we think the patient has an acute process, for example, it's the first time they show up with uveitis, we may continue a, a, a weekly taper by 2.5 milligrams intervals. However, if we think the patient has chronic disease, then we taper by one milligram per month. We, we go at a, a, at a slower pace. The reason we do this is because if, well, if this standard taper will give us a lot of information regarding the disease we're dealing with. If we have a patient that reactivates every time we go from 50 to 40 milligrams, 
we know that patient most likely has a severe form of disease and will likely need a very uh, a more aggressive form of immunosuppression rather than if a patient uh, reactivates let's say from 12.5 to 10 milligrams of prednisone at that interval, that patient, we may get away with a milder form of immunosuppression, perhaps something like 50 milligrams of methotrexate. So always taper prednisone in a standardized fashion. It'll give you lots of information regarding what disease you're dealing with, how, how severe that disease is. One more after the complete discontinuation of systemic ferrous, we see the patient develops a recurrence. Since we had activity less than three months after discontinuation. We rendered the patient as having chronic disease. We restart prednisone. However, at this time, we also start the patient on Humira. We do the standard prednisone taper. And by 18 months, where the patient's uveitis was inactive, we were able to discontinue prednisone altogether, and he remained 2020. However, at 21 months, while we, we decided, since he was quiet, he had been quiet for three months on only Humira every two weeks, we decided to taper that Humira to every four weeks. At that moment, he developed a very mild reactivation. If you can see the arrows, that's what I called a mild reactivation. He had very mild perivascular leakage. So we decided to go back to Humira every two weeks. A month later, that was gone, and he's quiet on Umira every two weeks, and the present plan is to keep him on the same therapy for one or two years to see if we can reach a remission. This is the second case. The second case is a 20, that of a 23-year-old white Hispanic man who was 23 when he first showed up, who complained of floaters in both eyes for several months. His referral diagnosis was floaters. He had an unremarkable past medical history, uh, family history was pertinent for hyper, hypertension, diabetes. Other than social alcohol use, there was no history of tobacco, illicit drugs, pets or recent travels, and the review assistance was negative. On examination, his visual acuity, best corrected, was 2040 in the right and 2020 in the left. Slit lamp examination was normal. He had two plus cell anterior and posteriorly in the right eye with some snowballs and one plus cells in the left. He had a very uh, swollen uh, peri, uh, peripapillary nerve fiber layer with some peripapillary CME. The macula had some nasal CME, otherwise the vessels and choroid were within normal limits. We ordered a basic workup. He had negative, was negative for syphilis, chest x-ray was unremarkable, normal brain MRI, norm, uh, negative quantiferon TB gold, and negative for Borrelia. We started the treatment in 2006. We gave the patient one milligram per kilogram of prednisone without exceeding 60 milligrams. We tapered it over three months down to the 10 milligram dose. However, at 10 milligrams, he was still active. So we started the patient on mycophonolate mofetil, which is Celsip, at a high dose of 1.5 uh, grams twice daily. He seemed me improved, but it did not resolve. He, we noticed some inferior vitreous extraction, so we decided to do a little bit of scatter laser to the inferior retina in the right eye. And after that treatment in 2008, he discontinued all his systemic medications other than topical nepathenep. 15 years later, in 2021, the patient continued on nepathenep. His visual acuity is still the same. He's very happy, only on nepathenep. This is how he's a fluorescein angiograms look in 20, uh, 15 years later, you can see that the disease is still active. He has some perivascular leakage. He has some peripapillary leakage and, and cystic macular edema in the right eye. The left eye it's, looks milder. However, it still has active disease. This is how his OCT looks in the right eye. He has an epiretinal membrane, some peripapillary CME. However, it's stable. And he does have some peripapillary nerve fiber layer swelling. However, the color plates are normal. He's happy. And that's to highlight how it could be a chronic indolent disease. So my take home message for all of you with regard to intermediate uveitis is choose your battles. Always treat ischemic vasculitis. Why? Because if they have retinal ischemia, it's very easy for those patients to develop optic disc ischemia, and that could lead to uh, an arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy and, and, and an optic nerve infarct, which can render a very poor prognosis for visual acuity recovery. Treat severe CME. 
always include multiple sclerosis in the differential. Beware of optic neuritis, which can occur just as it happens in multiple sclerosis. And also keep in mind that multiple sclerosis uh, can be a contraindication for anti-TNF alpha therapy. So one in intermediate uveitis, one would get, must get those MRIs to rule that out if one is considering anti-TNF treatments. Also, consider a diagnostic therapeutic parsiflana vitrectomy. First, it will, help to it will help to rule out lymphoma in recalcitrant cases, which is especially important in the elderly. And it also renders the patients at an increased possibility of remission. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Armando, for this an excellent uh, presentation as usual. We enjoy your talks and your cases. Thank you. I think Dr. Ahmad with us. Dr. Ahmad, if you have any question to Dr. Armando, he is waiting for you, for your questions. Armando, uh, hi. Very fantastic to see you, and congratulations for being the chair. That's fantastic. Thank you, my friend. And uh, very, uh, it's amazing presentation. You put nicely together everything. I like also the first slide on the history. That's fantastic. I just want to ask you a question. Um, so uh, your feeling is that vitrectomy can help in remission of intermediate uveitis because there's, I think there's a mixed really evidence here and the meta-analysis was done by, um, sorry, I remember her name, uh, Jennifer Davis, uh, Jennifer Davis group found actually it's hard to really uh, comment on this because most of the studies included cataract extraction, included use of canalog, including peeling. So I think, I think the drawback of vitrectomy is that um, um, the problem is the inflammation it may cause, which is minimal, but also it may limit the, the duration of canalog. It's, so I don't know what's your take on this. Well, uh, I, I completely get you, but there, there are different cases, of course. If you have a really hot eye that has very bad vasculitis and it's really doing, uh, uh, you know, you, you, has never been treated, that's probably not the eye you want to get into the OR to do a vitrectomy right away. That's, that's, that's for sure. Also, we must remember that many of these studies are from the old age. Well, I'm that I'm from that old age that I trained with 20 gauge that we were suturing the sclerotomy. That patients would get a dialysis every 10 cases, which is different from nowadays. Right? Like our, our fellows don't know how how easy they have it when they just pop in a 27 gauge vitrectomy and they do a case. So it's a very different surgery nowadays from what it was. Probably we should go for the best of both worlds, uh, unless it, it is a case in an elderly patient when we are really suspicious of lymphoma and we want to get that out. We should probably consider some treatment, uh, make that eye at least uh, uh, get it colder a little bit, and then we should go for the vitrectomy to, to treat that residual inflammation and just get them over the threshold. That's a, that's a great point. I think also when there's a complication like, uh, you know, an ERM that is significant despite treating macular edema, that might be a good rule for a good, uh, like, role for vitrectomy. But that's fantastic. Um, and I think other points, um, I mean, I think that's it. You've covered everything beautifully. Dr. Amri, do I have some time for yes, you, yes. your points? What's the time like? No, no, take your time. We are still in the beginning. We are okay. Up to yours. Okay. I just want to comment on a few points I uh, that re comes to my mind with intermediate guys. And Armando, please feel free to join in on these points. One sure. point really is the diagnosis of intermediate uveitis. I mean, Dr. Oliver here very nicely put all the criteria, but the problem is I find it's difficult to really diagnose intermediate uveitis. And the way I think of it is that you have inflammation in the vitreous or in the vitreous and the peripheral retina. And when you do imaging and pictures, there's not much happening in the posterior retina. It's mainly in the peripheral part of the retina. It, of course, excluding complications that can happen like papillitis or macular edema. But I think the pathology is more in the peripheral retina. You're allowed to get some peripheral vasculitis. You're allowed to get some chorioretinitis. And also you're allowed to get the complication like papillitis or macular edema or epiretinal membrane. So that's how I would diagnose intermediate uveitis. It can be easy if you have 
uh, snowballs and snow banking because that's an easy diagnosis. So Armando, what do you think of this way of thinking? Well, I, um, as, as a former fellow of Dr. Jabs, I'm oftentimes very pragmatic about what I call uh, uh, give a certain diagnosis. If they have cells in the vitreous, then that's intermediate. If they don't have cells in the vitreous and they only have perivascular sheathing, that's sheathing. And if they only have vasculitis, it's vasculitis. However, where does one end and the other one start? What is the primary pathology? That's very interesting. Oftentimes a patient might have uh, intermediate uveitis, may just be the term that we use to get the approval for the insurance to give them the Humira, because the patient, the main concern is just the real vasculitis that is the one that's gonna get the patient to go blind. So it's a, it's a matter of semantics rather than, than you know, it's a, the nail in it, so. I totally agree, but I think it's the, the issues that, for example, I mean, if you have patients with vasculitis that's more than peripheral, that's actually like posterior uveitis. But I totally agree. I think that at the end of the day, what you want to do is this a uveitis affecting the posterior segment, right? And then is this a non-infectious uveitis or is it infectious uveitis? And the next step, maybe it, maybe it will make some difference in treatment selection. You, as you said very beautifully, unilateral bilateral systemic disease was the general condition of the patient. But whether it's I think posterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis, it depends how vision affecting is it or vision threatening, right? Exactly. And there's even an issue with all their practitioners, people that did fellowships like before 1984, that uh, they would sometimes call what we now should call anterior and intermediate uveitis. They would just call it penuveitis and it doesn't even right. have like, yeah. So that's something right. we should really, the most important uh, thing for me is to, go get out of that terminology in which we're calling penuveitis something that's really anterior and intermediate. So, yeah, no, yes. I think that's, that's a great point. Yeah. And I think yeah. like Sue Lightman always said, okay, well, it's good to know, right? If this patient has sarcoid or something else, the of most course. important thing is to try to put them into three groups. Mm -hmm. Is this infectious uveitis or non-infectious or masquerade? Exactly. Then you can, okay, next question, next point is, okay, vision threatening, vision involving, or not. Then you can really know what you're dealing with. Okay, I think this is a great discussion. My next point is, okay, you have a patient with cystoid macroedema. We examine a patient, we find cystoid macroedema. The question is, how can you tell that this cystoid macroedema is due to intermediate uveitis? because one of the presentations, and the way I think about it is, okay, if you have a patient with stored macroedema, we need to examine the anterior segment, maybe for anterior uveitis, maybe for an IOL that is moving, uh, maybe for a vitreous wick after cataract surgery, then we need to look at the posterior segment for any posterior segment pathology like diabetic neuropathy, venous occlusion, and then you need also to uh, see what medications they take. Some medications are, have been like, okay, suspected of causing, at least suspected, and then the other thing, if you don't find anything in the anterior segment and in the posterior segment, don't forget to look at the periphery of the retina. That's the intermediate segment because you may find intermediate uveitis. What do you feel about this, Armando? I totally agree with you, but I would add to that that it's very important to get, a, for me, the ultra-wide field uh, fluorescein angiogram because intermediate uveitis will also give you some signs that there's some intraocular inflammation. You will see a hot disc, you will see some perivascular leakage, you will see uh, diffuse uh, retinal uh, leakage uh, throughout the fundus. And those signs will tell you, well, you know, this is inflammatory. And, and that's where we start making a sense of what's happening in the, in the intermediate component, compartment. Yes. Yes, fantastic. And I think to really have a good view of this area, you need a wide field imaging. Sometimes works as well on the optus. If you ask the photographer to take a picture while they're looking down, you can see up to the aura. Oh, that's, yes. Or you can invent or use a 30 lens. But remember that like the 20 lens and the 90 does not give you a very nice view of the very inferior part of the retina. Okay, yes. my next point is um, patient, a, a young patient presenting with vitreous hemorrhage. And one of the differential diagnoses in young patients with vitreous hemorrhage, among others, is actually intermediate uveitis. So I think I just I always remind the fellow that, you know, in young patients, you need to be considering uh, trauma, of course. In very, very young, you need to be considering shaken baby syndrome. But other things are, are include intermediate uveitis, 
toxocara, uveitis, and uh, X-linked retinal schesis as a cause of vitreous hemorrhage. And the reason they get this, as you've mentioned very beautifully in your complication slide, they actually, interestingly, they can get retinal new vascularization. They also can get vasoproliferative tumor and they also can get retinal schisis. And we had patients referred because of schisis, people causing detachment. And then when you look, it's actually a schisis with intermediate uveitis. And sure. several patients referred because of vasoproliferative tumor. What do you feel about uh, this? Any comment on this? Well, of course, we, we I would probably think about an, an earlier vitrectomy because if it's a young patient that's not a diabetic, we don't really know what's, we can have an ultrasound and have an idea of what's causing it, but we want to make sure that it does not progress to, to a full retinal detachment, because if it does, then we have a higher risk of PBR. And, and we want to definitely want to, a clear surgery would be in my mind, but definitely uh, my threshold for surgery would be lower in such cases, unless I can have a very good view. And then if I have a very good view and I'm not concerned that we're gonna get a, a retinal detachment anytime soon, then I might just treat the patient a little bit and see if I can calm the inflammation before I go in. Right. I, I think I just have a slightly different view on the retinal detachment and the schizos. Uh, with intermediate uveitis, I've, the tractional ones, the tractional attachment usually don't extend, and the schizes usually don't extend. I think the schizes and the vasoproliferative tumor are indicators usually of under-treatment, so they need to treat yeah. more. But as long as there is no break, usually I would keep an eye. The peripheral OCT with the optus is fantastic because it can tell you if this is schizes or detachment. But just be aware of these unusual which actually they happen in maybe like 10, 15% of cases, but if you don't examine the extreme periphery, you don't see them and then you panic when you see them. Definitely, definitely. Okay, and uh, um, I think that's really what, I just wanted to try to cover like unusual points in intermediate uveitis, but I think you've covered everything so beautifully. Thank you. What's your Thank first you. goal? Uh, a first to go uh, immunomodulation is a cell sept or or Humira from the beginning or what do you do? Let's say intermediate uveitis and posterior non-infectious uveitis in general. I, I generally go for cell sept because of the safety profile and it is so inexpensive in in the United States. It's at least sixty one dollars a month for the high dose versus four to 5,000 uh, a month for Humira. And even most insurance companies will cover Humira, at least in, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, still, um, it's very easy to get cells up. And the side effect profile is so, so naive that why not do cells up as first choice? I feel very comfortable giving cells up either to young people or to elderly patients. And then for a second choice, it depends what the brain MRI shows. If there are any concerns for multiple sclerosis, I oftentimes go to something like ACTAR if I cannot get them off of prednisone, or I might choose another, another anti-metabolite or add cyclosporin. That's fantastic. I think just one concern, which is coming to the surface now more and more about cell set, I think because of the uh, industry really uh, raising attention about that is teratogenicity. And the concern about teratogenicity, if you're giving it to uh, sexually active people, even men. So I think always consider this. They're also like on the internet, there are several um, warning about this. So, so make sure you tell your patients that they should not uh, really uh, have a uh, planned family while on cell sept. Uh, so always mention that, which really we're, we're, we're doing now. And uh, yeah. I think that's everything. Well, thank you so much, Armando, for sharing your knowledge. Dr. Ahmed, we have uh, two questions more. We have here questions from their colleagues here. Sure. Uh, the first one, do you go to, uh, it is by, anyway, by, it's by Dr. Ashraf Awaja. He is saying, do you go to vitrectomy for persistent uh, uh, micular edema just or for treatment, active intermediate uveitis resistant to medical treatment? I think this is a great question. I think we answered in the middle. I'll answer it again and I'll get Dr. Oliver to answer it. For me, really, I go for treatment uh, mainly if there's a as a diagnostic or for if there's a complications. I don't do uh, vitrectomy, even intermediate uveitis, to control the disease. 
So cystoid macroedema, I would treat it with systemic and intravitreal therapy. I would only operate on that if there's tractional component that's significant and not responding to uh, medical, including intravitreal treatment. Dr. Armand, do you want to add anything on that or? Yes, I would only go to to vitrectomy for, for the treatment of macular edema. If there's some reason, I can go for either more immunosuppression or systemic therapy or intravitreal therapy. Those are the cases like, for example, if it's a, a case of infectious uh, intermediate uveitis or the patient has a history of healed uh, retinitis that I can do intravitreal therapy, then I would uh, probably choose to, to go for uh, internal limiting membrane peel to treat that intermediate, that CME. Okay. Uh, can, I, can, I add something very, can I yeah. add something very quickly? Okay. Uh, yeah. I think one thing is as well to know that uveitic macular edema, uh, traditional uh, uh, immunosuppressive therapy, like conventional one, like Celsept and mesotrexate and cyclosporin, they work well for inflammation, but they don't work that well for macular edema. And there's evidence that what works better is intravitreal therapy. Also, anti-TNF works well and um, interferon works well for this. So sometimes you get that which is not responding to conventional treatment. Then you may need bridging therapy or you need additional therapy with intravitreal treatment. So just consider that uh, because for some reason, conventional treatment does not work so well for macular edema. <clears throat> No, definitely. And and here in the tropics that we have many steroid responders, um, I found myself using uh, actor a whole lot more recently because it's an ACTH analog and we suspect it might have MCR receptor uh, effectiveness. And in those patients, as for example, we treat with systemic or, or intravitreal steroids and they have an IOP of 60 uh, after a single implant. For those patients, I might do some actor. And we, I found that many of those patients, they have resolution of their system macular edema. And oftentimes we can even get them off of many other systemic immunosuppressors. Yeah. Actar is ACTH, it's a systemic treatment. Um, Armando, can I ask you something? I had limited experience with ACTAR. My, my concern about it is I think it has the same side effects of systemic steroids. What's your take on this? Oh, definitely not uh, in my experience. Uh, I, yeah. the typical patient in which we use ACTAR uh, will have failed at least CELSEP. I have, for example, I have a patient, she's a, a, a law student, young woman, and uh, she was a uh, normal weight. She was on, on prednisone, uh, CELSEP, and anti-TNF, and we could not get her below a 20 milligram of prednisone dose without getting significant CME. We tried Osirdex, and she had an IOP of 60. I gave her Actor. I was able to, and then since Actor is stimulating the adrenal glands, you can get them off of prednisone very fast, like in, in a month or a couple of weeks, because you're stimulating the adrenal glands, so that's not an issue. And the good thing is they come back to their normal weight, their normal fat distribution, their normal appearance. And even if their uveitis control, which is good, it's let's suppose it's not 100% gone, they look, they feel so much better with themselves that then they're happy with the treatment. And they can, and even if they, they have a, a, a chronic disease, it's a treatment they, they, they can live with. And, and it's, don't, I've seen don't that. they get systemic side effects of steroid with the XR? <laughs> No, no, not as many, not as many. And, and then they, they lose weight. And my common, the, what I've seen in these patients is that they come less often. They start show, missing appointments and coming every three months because they feel good about themselves once again, and they're just happy. They That's interesting. There. Yes. Okay, and we have another more questions. Um, he's asking, why not methotroxate as a first-line treatment in intermediate uveitis? So I think I, that's a really great question. And there was yes. a study, a retro, I think, I can't remember if it was retrospective or prospective. And I think we may have cited it in our focal point. It was point prospective by Nisha. Yeah. It was by but, Nisha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. And I think it was really frowned upon because it shows that both work the same, right? Or, or metric state was better. It shows something that people did not expect. But the general feeling is that CellCept works better and CELCEPT is well more tolerated. But I think this study, I can't remember if it showed equal or showed methotrexate works better. It, it, I, remember, it was, I wonder if you remember. 
I think it was not inferior to both of them. I think it sells up oh, was a little bit better for intermediate. However, it's important to, sh to, to show that they, they did this study twice. The first time she did it, uh, she shows a fifth, uh, fifth uh, lower cell sub dose with a higher methotrexate dose, and that was criticized. So for the second time she did it, she did a 1.5 gram twice daily of cell sub versus 25 milligrams per week of methotrexate. And then they found that both were equally as good. So I think the take home message from the study is first, uh, Contrary to what perhaps I was doing 10 years ago, I no longer fiddle around with lower dosages of treatment. I just go straight to 25 milligrams per week of methotrexate, or I just go straight to 1.5 grams straight daily of Celsa. And only if the patients don't uh, tolerate it, then I would go to the lower dose. Another good take, uh, thing about methotrexate is that it works, it's better absorbed if you split the dose. If you want to give a patient 25 milligrams, you should probably give half uh, the dose on Saturdays and half the dose on Sundays, and you get better absorption and even better absorption if you do subcutaneous methotrexate. So that's something that that uh, is also a good um, pointer for, for methotrexate therapy. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Armando and Dr. Ahmed. Just we want thank to you. just uh, allow us just to have like a conclusion about intermediate TVIs because you are talking uh, as an expert, you are me, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Armando, you are an EVITS guys and you are knowing all the things that you can go here and here. But if you want to ask someone who is not dealing with EVITS only in some cases, uh, I feel that's intermediate when you are, I mean, describe it, then I can say it is a ban uveitis because I can see mm -hmm. there is a vitritis, I can see there is uh, vasculitis, I can see there is uh, anterior uh, cells. So uh, what is, uh, I mean, uh, if there is uh, something that it can guide you to, to say this is an intermediate and um, directly instead of saying, no, this is an intermediate or ban uveitis or and also you have mentioned several diseases that you G will be and seeing that they are affecting like budgets, it's a ban uveitis rather than, but it is come sometimes intermediate. Is it an, a separate or it is part of the ban uveitis as you are mentioned here? Well, uh, it, I, I know Ahmed would probably see it as posterior uveitis if it has a very bad uh, posterior vasculi uh, vasculitis, uh, for example, in budgets. But if you think about it, that the vasculitis in Vechet is causing ischemia and that's a retinal problem. So it's, it's like more almost like as if a patient had retinitis. So that's probably a pan uveitis. However, uh, I would call intermediate uveitis those cases where you have absence of retinitis, absence of choroiditis, and the vasculitis is, is probably non ischemic in, in a sense. Uh, you know, although um, I would probably say non-ischemic vasculitis or, or, or ischemic vasculitis that's not associated with a with a systemic disease or suspicions. That's that's probably how I would see it. It's, it's a bit of a complicated answer, but uh, but that's uh, maybe Ahmed has uh, can simplify that. No, I, think, answer I think as Armando summarized, really, I think I think to be honest. The differentiation is not that important, as Armando beautifully mentioned. Sure. The main thing is not infectious or infectious and affecting the procedure segment. And then is, the, is it vision involving, vision threatening, or none of the above? Because none of the above, you don't need to treat them. You can just watch it. And many cases of intermediate UVS can be watched if there's no cystoid macroedema, there's no much hot disk, and the vision is good, and the patient just travels those floaters. So I think that's, that's an important thing. Whether you take the pragmatic definition where you say, okay, well, vitritis and any peripheral retinochroidal vascular lesion, but just peripheral, except uh, disc, the disc inflammation and macular edema, which are a complication. Otherwise, and, then that's a procedure of uveitis. And you one know, thing I always say, to... yeah, well, one thing I always say is that nobody goes blind because of lack of diagnosis or, or lack of, they always go blind because of lack of therapy. So you might call it anything, any name you, you want, as long as if you treat it correctly, the patient will not go blind. So the important thing is, uh, is to identify it as an inflammatory disorder and to treat it. So it's everything else is just semantics and will make the patient go blind. And, and look for more... in patient... 
Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Ahmed. Yes. I think look for it. Uh, I mean, I think a, a common, young patient with floaters, look for it. Uh, look for it in cystoid macular edema, which you're not sure where it's coming from, because then you have to examine the peripheral retina. Young patient with vitreous hemorrhage, look for it as well. So these are really like uh, a significant anti or anti segment reaction, really, which with significant spillover. And you're thinking this is only a spillover. Examine the peripheral retina. I think in these four okay. scenarios, you're more likely to look for anti for um, in, you're more likely to find intermediate UVS. Okay, Ahmed, there is also as uh, Dr. Armando mentioned in the beginning that 80, as if I do remember exactly, 80 percent is idiopathic. 50 around 50. Oh, around 50. Okay, so uh, in these cases, you are not going to find any cause, but you are going to see an inflammation, and you have to treat as accordingly. Right. Exactly. Uh, the thing is, as Doctor, my, my mentor, Doctor Jazz, would say, we always want to round up the usual suspects. Make sure there's no syphilis, no sarcoidosis, and get a good systemic uh, physical exam and an MRI, which is pertinent for this. But if you don't find anything, then chances are it's just intermediate uveitis. And if suppose you're missing something that's inflammatory, then one thing that's very important about the treatment paradigm is in the world of ubiitis, 90% is autoimmune and 10% is infectious. That 10% which is infectious, if one rule out, well, rules out the most common things such as syphilis, Borrelia, Lyme disease, etc., then that 10% chance will make it a 0 0.000001 chance of it being infectious. Therefore, if we rule out the most common infectious causes, then it's over a 99% chance that it is autoimmune. So whatever it is, if we treat it as an autoimmune disease, we'll probably be treating the underlying condition as well. So that's also something that's all, that I always keep in mind when dealing with this. I condition. think these are great uh, rules that you give it now at the end. Very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anything, Dr. Ahmed, to add before we come? Yeah, just one point. I think um, Armando said a great rule. One thing as well, intermediate uveitis in young patients, uh, one thing to think about, especially if it's unilateral toxicara, intermediate uveitis in all patients, uh, something very important to rule uh, is lymphoma, especially yes. when it's a new in all patients. Just remember these. So syphilis, uh, syphilis and MS are important. Uh, lymphoma and toxicara, these are important ones. Usually it's idiopathic. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, Dr. Armando. It was very great session and discussions with you and Dr. Ahmad Salam. As usual, so, we are uh, having a very interesting discussions as usual, learning a lot of points from you. So I think it's very nice that uh, everyone hearing us or they can go back to this discussion and he will get more and more information uh, while repeating and listening more to all these great discussions. Uh, before we conclude, also, uh, uh, there is the link of all previous uh, episodes available in the chats. Please, uh, if there is anyone you couldn't get because I saw someone is say not registered, um, please, you can go. If you are not registered and you didn't attend, maybe you are not able, but if you register before, so you can get uh, the certificate easily. And also now they will upload in the chat for the today. So you can please get your attendance certificate. Um, also, we'd like to uh, invite you also in the next Saturday, we'll have our uh, fourth episode of Medical Retina Series. Uh, and I would like to thank Dr. Armando, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Satya. A special thanks for uh, uh, Abi Alargan for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, thanks for the management event. And thanks for all participants and attendees. Thank you very much and have a nice evening and night. Good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Satya and Dr. Ahmad Rashid also. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.